It was Christian Bovey who said, There is great beauty in going through life without anxiety or fear. Half our fears are baseless. The other half, discreditable. Hello. This is Nelson Olmstead. Recently in my reading, I came across a book of short stories that I thought was exceptionally original. It was entitled Dark Carnival, and the author is Ray Bradbury. Today, I'd like to bring you what, in my opinion, is one of the best stories from this collection. It's a powerful tale written, you may be surprised to discover, about yourself. And it's entitled The Night. You are a child in a small town. You are, to be exact, eight years old, and it's growing late at night. Late for you, accustomed to bedding in at 9 or 9.30. Once in a while, perhaps, begging Mom or Dad to let you stay up later to hear Sam and Henry on that strange radio that's popular in this year of 1927. But most of the time, you're in bed and snug at this time of night. It's a warm summer evening. You and your mother are all alone at home in the warm darkness of summer. Finally, just before it's time for Mrs. Singer to close her store, Mother tells you, run and get a pint of ice cream and be sure she packs it tight. You ask if you can get a scoop of chocolate ice cream on top because you don't like vanilla and Mother agrees. You clutch the money and run barefooted over the warm evening cement sidewalk under the apple trees and oak trees toward the store. The town is so quiet and far off. You can only hear the crickets sounding in the spaces beyond the hot indigo trees that hold back the stars. When you get back with the ice cream, you find Mom still ironing. She looks hot and irritated, but she smiles just the same. When will Dad be home from the lodge meeting? Oh, about 11.30 or 12, Mother replies. She takes the ice cream to the kitchen, divides it, giving you your special portion of chocolate. She dishes out some for herself, and the rest is put away. For Skipper and your father when they come. Skipper is your brother. He is your older brother. He's 12 and healthy, and he is allowed to stay up later than you. Not much later, but enough to make him feel it's worthwhile having been born first. He's over on the other side of town this evening to a game of kick the can. And soon he'll come clomping home, smelling of sweat and green grass on his knees where he fell, and smelling very much in all ways like Skipper, which is natural. You sit enjoying the ice cream. You're at the core of the deep, quiet summer night. Your mother and yourself, and the night all around this small house on this small street. You both sit there listening to the summer silence. The dark is pressed down by every window and door. There is no sound because the radio needs a new battery. And you've played all the Knickerbocker Quartet records and Al Jolson and two Black Crow records to exhaustion. So, you just sit on the hardwood floor by the door and look out into the dark, pressing your nose against the screen until the flesh of its tip is molded into small, dark squares. I... I wonder where your brother is, Mother says after a while. He should be home by now. It's almost 9.30. He'll be here, you say, knowing very well that he will be. Well, Mom sits down a moment, then stands up, goes to the door, and calls. You listen to her calling and calling. Skipper! Skipper! Over and over. Her calling goes out into the summer, warm, dark, and never comes back. The echoes pay no attention. Get And as you sit on the floor, a coldness that is not ice cream and not winter and not a part of summer's heat goes through you. You notice Mom's eyes sliding, blinking, the way she stands undecided and is nervous. All of these things. She opens the screen door. Stepping out into the night, she walks down the steps and down the front sidewalk under the lilac bush. You listen to her moving feet. She calls again. Silence. The screen door opens and Mother says, 
Come on, Shorts. We'll take a walk. Where to? Just down the block. Come on. You better put on your shoes, though. You'll catch cold. No, no, I'll be all right. You take her hand. Together you walk down St. James Street. You smell lilacs in blossom, fallen apples lying crushed and odorous in the deep grass. Underfoot, the concrete is still warm, and the crickets are sounding louder against the darkening dark. You reach the corner, turn, and walk toward the ravine. I wish your father was home, says Mother. Her large hand tightens around your small one. Just wait till I get that boy. I'll spank him within an inch of his life. A razor strap hangs in the kitchen for this, but you doubt Mother will carry out her promise. Now you walk another block and are standing by the holy black silhouette of the German Baptist Church. In back of the church, a hundred yards away, the ravine begins. You can smell it. It's a dark sewer, rotten foliage, thick green odor. It's a wide ravine that cuts and twists across the town, a jungle by day, a place to let alone at night, Mother has often declared. You are only eight years old. You know little of death, fear, or dread. Death is a waxen effigy in the coffin when you were six, and grandfather passed away, looking like a great fallen vulture in his casket, silent, withdrawn. No more to tell you how to be a good boy. No more to comment succinctly on politics. Death is your little sister one morning. When you awaken at the age of seven, look into her crib and see her staring up at you with a blind, blue, fixed, and frozen stare until the men came in with a small wicker basket to take her away. Death is when you stand by her high chair four weeks later and suddenly realize she will never be in it again, laughing and crying and making you jealous of her because she was born. That is death. But this is more than death. This is the ravine. Here and now, down there, in that pit of jungle blackness, is suddenly all the evil you will ever know, evil you will never understand. Down there, in the huddled shadow, among thick trees and trailed vines, lives the odor of decay. Here, at this spot, civilization ceases, reason ends, and a universal evil takes over. You realize you're alone, you and your mother. Her hand trembles. Her hand trembles. Why? Your belief in your private world is shattered. Is she too doubtful? But she is bigger and stronger, more intelligent than yourself, isn't she? Does she, too, feel that intangible menace, that groping out of darkness, that crouching below? The essential impact of life's loneliness crushes your beginning to tremble body. Mother is alone, too. She can't look to the sanctity of marriage, the protection of her family's love. She can't look to the United States Constitution or the city police. She can't look anywhere in this very instant, save into her heart. And there she'll find nothing but uncontrollable repugnance and a will to fear. In this instant, it is an individual problem seeking an individual solution. You must accept being alone and work on from there. You swallow hard, cling to her. Mother advances down the path into the primeval jungle. Your voice trembles. Mom, Skip's all right. Skip's all right. He's all right. Mother's voice is strained, high. He always comes through here. I tell him not to, but those darn kids, they come through here anyway. Some night he'll come through and never come out again. Never come out again. That could mean anything. Tramps, criminals, darkness, accident. Most of all, death. Alone in the universe. There are a million small towns like this all over the world, each as dark, as lonely, each as removed, as full of shuddering and wonder. Oh, the vast, swelling loneliness of them, the secret, damp ravines of them. Life is a horror lived in them at night, when at all sides sanity, marriage, children, happiness is threatened by an ogre called death. 
Mother raises her voice into the dark. Skip! Skipper! Skip! Skipper! Suddenly, both of you realize that there's something wrong. Something very wrong. You listen intently and realize what it is. The crickets have stopped chirping. Silence is complete. Never in your life a silence like this one, one so utterly complete. Why should the crickets cease? Why? What reason? They have never stopped before, not ever. Unless, unless something is going to happen. It's as if the whole ravine is tensing, bunching together its black fibers, drawing in power from all about sleeping countrysides for miles and miles. In ten seconds now, something will happen. Something will happen. The crickets keep their truce. The stars are so low you can almost brush the tinsel. There are swarms of them, hot and sharp, growing, growing, the silence, growing, growing, the tenseness. Oh, it's so dark, so far away from everything. And then, way off across the ravine. Okay, Mom. Coming, Mother. And again. Hi, Mom. Coming, Mom. And then the quick scuttering of tennis shoes padding down through the pit of the ravine as three kids come dashing and giggling. Your brother Skipper, Chuck Redman, and Augie Bartz running and giggling. The stars suck up like stung antenna of ten million snails. The crickets sing. The darkness pulls back, startled, shocked, angry. Pulls back, losing its appetite at being so rudely interrupted as it prepared to feed. As the darkness retreats like a wave on a shore, three kids pile out of it, laughing. Hi, Mom. Hi, Shorts. Hey. It smells like Skipper, all right. Sweat and grass and his oiled leather baseball glove. Young man, you're going to get a licking, declares Mother. She puts away her fear instantly. You know she will never tell anybody of it, ever. It will be in her heart, though, for all time, as it's in your heart for all time. You walk home to bed in the late summer night. You're glad Skipper's alive, very glad. For a moment you thought, (laughs) far off in the dim, moonlit country, a train goes rushing along, and it whistles like a lost metal thing, nameless and running. You go to bed, shivering beside your brother, listening to that train whistle, and thinking of a cousin who lived way out in the country, a cousin who died of pneumonia late at night years and years ago. You smell the sweat of Skip beside you. It's magic. You stop trembling. You hear footsteps outside the house on the sidewalk as Mother's turning out the lights. A man clears his throat in a way you recognize. Mom says, That's your father. It is. have just heard Ray Bradbury's short story, The Night, as told by Nelson Olmsted. And now a closing word. Well, this story is included, as I said, in Ray Bradbury's excellent collection of short stories, Dark Carnival. Bradbury is one of our new writers in this country, and in my opinion, one of the most original. The music today was arranged and played by Lou Webb. This is Nelson Olmsted saying goodbye and good reading. Nelson Armstead has presented another great short story from the world of literature. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.